everyone. Um, if we'll just get started in a minute or two. Um, the idea is we um, do a 30 minute presentation, uh, which I'll start and then uh, Kenneth will um, speak and then we'll have a session for uh, questions at the end. So um, initially, if you could all kindly uh, put yourself on mute in terms of the way the webinar will function, um, we will have time for questions. So at the end, um, once complete, if you could uh, send your question through or unmute yourself and ask the question, um, then Kenneth uh, will be able to answer that. Okay, without further ado, um, let's uh, get started. So um, we're here today to discuss the India 2030 Fund, uh, which is a fund launched uh, in partnership uh, of India Avenue and Oldbridge Capital Management based in uh, Mumbai. Um, the fund was launched in January 2022. Uh, and the agenda today is essentially just a quick introduction of the fund. Uh, Oldbridge discussing their investment process, the current state of play in India, um, fund thematics that are existent in the fund today, as well as uh, Kenneth's uh, track record in his history in the Indian asset management industry, um, before we turn to questions. In terms of the fund, the fund is essentially a, a theme-based fund, so it doesn't invest in everything. It's not a benchmark-aware structure. The focus is really to uh, find themes in India which we think will work over the course of the decade and uh, leave out certain, uh, it could be potentially large segments of the market because uh, they may be going through a sideways phase or uh, a more difficult operating environment to what was faced in the prior decades. So really the fund looks to focus on three to five themes, uh, apply a capital cycle approach uh, to investing, uh, we'll have uh, no more than 20 stocks in the portfolio, and there'll be a bias towards uh, emerging businesses in the sense that these businesses are already profitable, but they're emerging in the sense of uh, their addressable market growing um, and their potential uh, of that business growing significantly from this point. Uh, in terms of performance of the fund, uh, this is uh, its early days yet. It's been around for um, now about 18 months. Um, the performance so far has been quite good uh, from a one-year perspective, um, six months, um, three months, what, whatever uh, period you look at. Uh, and that's been driven by the style and uh, philosophy employed by Oldbridge. And the absolute numbers are driven by Indian market being, um, you know, uh, quite attractive from local investment increasing, as well as more lately foreign investors coming into the market. In terms of Oldbridge, uh, Oldbridge is a boutique investment firm founded in 2015 um, by Kenneth Andrade, um, who's been around in the industry for well over 20 years um, and has experienced um, you know, I would say uh, spectacular performance in Indian markets over that time period. Um, and, you know, when Oldbridge uh, looks at their client base, it's predominantly India's family offices, private wealth, and um, increasingly uh, some uh, foreign investors, particularly a prominent US endowment fund. Oldbridge is an advisor to the India Avenue Equity Fund and is one of the three advisors in that fund. And uh, is the only advisor to the India 2030 fund. Um, so that's essentially the, the structure uh, of the relationship and the background of Oldbridge. I'll now pass you over to Kenneth Andrade to uh, commence the next part of the presentation. Mm -hmm. hey, thanks, Oganda. Um, uh, good afternoon, good morning uh, to all of you. Um, I just uh, spent a few minutes uh, giving an oversight of uh, how we got here both from a from a investment style for style and how we've been able to implement it through multiple uh, multiple uh, years in in the indian environment uh, a simple thing to do uh, and mugundan's uh, uh, 
said this earlier is that we're very uh, sector focused. Uh, should I say we're very industry focused. We try to capture a business opportunity early into the cycle. We're usually the first institutional investor in, in that particular industry. Uh, and from there, we just build our positions and, and ride with, with the investment idea through the cycle. Uh, and that's what and that's what we've known for. And at any point in time, we usually the top three uh, top three investor in that particular business. Now we uh, while our 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 portfolio might seem to have a capitalization bias, which is small and mid cap. But all the companies that we own in that particular industry are the largest in their space. So we very rarely trade down into number two or number three uh, uh, businesses. So so we so essentially it's buying a business in distress or in, in the uh, other end of the entire uh, uh, in, uh, corporate cycle, becoming one of the largest investors and right through the entire cycle. If I have to put that in a graph, uh, the next slide actually explains essentially where it is. Uh, uh, the business cycle is highlighted on the left and the, and the valuation cycle is highlighted on the right. And essentially, we buy when the industry is consolidated, sell when the industry is fragmenting. For us, valuation metrics are price to book, okay, price to replacement cost, and our sell metrics is when every business in the industry is making money. So when the industry return on equity or return on capital employed is significantly higher than the cost of capital, we tend to get worried. This is where also the uh, where also a lot of a lot of companies trade uh, over uh, over their mean uh, price earning multiples. So we are valuation focused at both ends of the entire cycle. We are happy to give away big companies which are doing extremely well in their entire formats. Uh, in short, um, if I uh, if I had to put it in a stock format, our best place to look for new ideas is 52 week lows. Our best place to look for sell ideas is 52 week highs, and that's essentially the trade that we've implemented over multiple years. Okay, the next the next slide essentially gives us a give, gives us a, a deeper dive in into our our process. Uh, the uh, uh, a lot of investors focus on on uh, on demand generation or how how demand is growing. Uh, we look at it on the opposite side. Uh, we look at capacity and supply. And the reason why we look at supply and capacity is that is predictable and that is known. Everything is available in corporate balance sheets or everything is available in an industry format. Capacity growth that comes into an entire environment or into an entire industry is documented. Demand is not. Demand usually goes in line with if GDP has grown for the last uh, um, for the last decade at a percentage of about six percent. Uh, most analysts uh, uh, take that as a base number and ex extrapolate that number going forward. Uh, but supply it comes in phases where uh, if an industry does well, it, it, it comes in phases like industry usually expands capacity by 20%, 30%, and 40%. And these numbers are significantly higher for an economy which is growing at 6% to digest. So we try to anticipate most of these trends. And in anticipating most of these trends, we, we probably a little early into the cycle, but we made a significant amount of money on the way up. Uh, the next slide that we uh, that we talk about is the companies that we prefer to invest in. Like, like you see, we we tend to be early investors, and we try to be the largest investor in most of the most of the corporates that are there. So we do not go hunting for the smallest company in the entire business. We look for companies that consolidate the company, consolidate the industry. Uh, it, we, uh, I mean, in in the consumer space or or any industrial space. The last standing company usually has the lowest cost of customer acquisition. The, the, the survivor usually gets the benefit of acquiring customers at the lowest cost ever. And that's why we prefer consolidators. Usually they end up being monopolistic. It is, and when we talk about monopolies, we talk about companies that monopolize the profitability of the entire metric. In most of the commodity spaces that we've seen, and, and we do invest in reasonable amount of commodity businesses in the country, 
uh, whether it is a, a, a small agri commodity like sugar, corn, um, or a hard commodity like steel and aluminium. India usually has just one company at the end of the cycle making money, everyone else loses it. And that's essentially a place that we go bargain hunting for. Uh, while we're doing this, uh, we're looking at companies with zero financial uh, leverage. And leverage in India is usually extremely high. Uh, so what you see, uh, what we have seen over the last two decades is the corporates uh, uh, borrowing, uh, borrowing between 8% and 12%. But if they default in the first cycle, their uh, their their cost of debt goes to fifteen percent and 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 significantly higher. So our preference has always been for companies with zero financial leverage or low financial leverage, as the case may be. That that doesn't mean that we're not looking for capital efficient businesses. Uh, our definition of capital efficient business is, is the last man standing. Now, return on equity could go as low as. 5% and 6%. But if it's the only company surviving, every other business in that entire industry has, has is, is either losing money, okay, or is, it's extremely high in leverage. So we do look for efficiency, but we do not look for a single data point. The last standing survivor, even if it has a 5 or a 6% return on equity, uh, we tend to believe that that number goes, will go significantly higher in the entire uh, once the industry turns around. So if I had to put this in a, uh, articulate this in a different format, our journey of investing is from a 5% return on equity to a 15% return on equity. Our, our journey of investing is between a 10% operating margin or a, or a contribution margin to a 30% operating margin and that's and that's our journey and obviously when we, we, we're implementing most of this uh, companies usually come in reasonably cheap uh, i'll flip over to the next uh, next format uh, uh, which is essentially where india stands as far as the uh, environment is now we've highlighted a lot of uh, uh, a lot of columns and rows in blue uh, but the three columns that you uh, have uh, uh, which are interesting from from this conversation is column one uh, in blue, uh, and second and third. Now, column one is the debt equity of the business or the leverage of businesses in India. And if you scroll down from 1999 to 2023, and 2023 are preliminary numbers, we haven't got all the numbers yet from, uh, from corporate India, but that gives you a sense of where we stand. Uh, as an industry, we completely deleveraged. Corporate India is completely deleveraged. And I have a couple of slides on the to show you how corporate India's place in the financial system. Uh, uh, everyone's got surplus cash. Uh, nobody has any appetite for debt. And the key to it all is the uh, capacity utilization. So if you look at column two, the capacity utilization stands closer to about 80%. So we still have 20% of capacity utilization to go, right? So with surplus cash, uh, and and significant amount of capacity utilization left. And the next 10% of incremental demand or in, in capacity utilization can take ROEs anywhere close to close to 20%. And I think that's the structure that we've, uh, uh, that's the structure that Indian corporates, uh, how Indian corporates are in place. In my last uh, write-up to investors, I had mentioned that corporate India has got a problem of plenty. Solvent balance sheets, spare capacity and can expand capacity with all internal cash generation. Okay, this is very unlike what we've seen anywhere in the West. Uh, the, the, the following couple of slides are, is a, say, are essentially saying the same thing, but from the banking perspective, uh, what we put here is top 500 companies in India uh, from, a, uh, from a credit perspective. Okay, and, and this is across uh, almost across a decade. In two thousand, and we've chosen the top five hundred companies because they represent close to about thirty percent of of India GDP. So uh, the other bar chart that you see on the right hand side is India's largest corporate bank, which is State Bank of India, and then you see the total banking sector credit that was there. So if you look at the corporate credit or borrowings of corporate. India in 2014, okay, it was approximately two two times the size of uh, India's largest bank uh, advance total advances. If you look at the the entire statistic in today's environment, corporate India's 
credit is only one time that of the total the, of the largest bank out there. So the bank balance sheets have grown. The demand for credit by the bank, by corporates have not grown. Okay. So with both these slides, uh, you note we've noticed that the uh, uh, the leverage is at its all time low. And the banking balance sheet has grown, and corporates have enough, and banks have enough of liquidity to actually lend into corporate India. And expansion and 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 drivers of capacity are or drivers of, for capacity, which include uh, raising of capital, is no longer a problem for uh, for 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 corporate India. Uh, the next slide says something reasonably similar. Essentially, shows us how 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 the banking balance sheet is, has grown, which is all the advances that you see in the bar charts, and how the uh, non-performing assets or the credit costs have actually collapsed. We are staring at some, some of the lowest credit costs that the country has seen over, over the past decade plus. And I think that's, that's essentially uh, also indicating that banks are not taking enough of a risk. And if they take enough of a risk and corporate takes enough of a risk, I think we're heading into a decade where cap capital expansion or capex expansion on the ground could be significantly high in virtually every format that in every industry that that is that could be there. Uh, the next slide uh, shows you a longer term trend of where we are. Uh, we started the entire century uh, or the year 2000 with being 1.2 percent of global uh, global GDP as a market share. Today we are three and a half percent of global GDP. Now, why this is very important for us, uh, and why is this slide very important? Because our underlying underlying thought process about uh, about the Indian Indian environment is that if we have to grow from 3.5% of world GDP to 5% of world GDP, we have to take market share from the rest of the world. Now, if I tie this in with the previous commentary that I have uh, put together, we, we have the balance, corporate India has the balance sheet to do it because we're generating enormous of cash and the liability franchise with the banks, banks are sitting with surplus liquidity to fund corporate India to go down this path. Okay. So, so that's where we are. We as an environment are sitting. I think the other metric that is not here, uh, but you would you would uh, uh, identify with this that we are in the journey of taking our per capita income higher. India's average per capita income is about two thousand four hundred dollars. Uh, two thousand four hundred dollars, and probably the best place to uh, to to provide the rest of the world with. Uh, one, a large service economy in terms of outsourcing, a large manufacturing output, which is fairly competitive, especially in the labor, uh, because we have a huge labor arbitrage, which would pick up in terms of importing jobs, importing jobs and taking GDP upwards. And I think that's where we'll start our entire, uh, in, entire cycle all over again. Now, if you point to the portfolio where we stand, <laughs> and this is where... Uh, uh, where we are from a from a price earnings point of view, in 2021, uh, this was where the portfolio was in in uh, alignment with the uh, with the broad benchmark. Uh, the dotted line is where India's Nifty 50 is. Uh, the top light gray line was where the Nifty 500 was, and our portfolio is slightly below that uh, below that in terms of the price earning multiple. Uh, what we see on the right hand side, 2023, uh, while the benchmark in indices have been trading between uh, 20 times and 20, 25 times, our portfolio is consistently uh, below below that benchmark in terms of a price earning multiple. So, uh, so that so we very cognizant of this. Uh, simply because uh, we wouldn't want to. Uh, our entire investment process is a is a mix of uh, is a mix of picking the right industry at which is competitive in the global context context and also uh, the valuations have to be fair as 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 we we continue our uh, as we continue to take market share uh, as these companies continue to take market share from their global peers switch over to the uh, portfolio exposure and concent and and mix 
Uh, we run close to about 20 companies. We haven't exceeded that number. And our number has been between 18 and 20, more, more or less at 18 uh, together. And it's fairly diversified, but there is one large pool of, uh, uh, of portfolio, which is uh, exposed to, uh, to or, or actually um, exposed to the international environment. These are, some of them are commoditized businesses. But a large part of that is pharmaceuticals, uh, metals. Okay, uh, even in the urban consumption format, which is fourteen percent of our entire portfolio, it is real estate. Now, real estate down south is also exposed to something that is uh, technology or technology services, because that industry is the largest employer of uh, of engineers in the country. Uh, we are significantly large. Uh, we have a significantly large presence in the international market. So almost sixty percent market share of all global outsourcing that is there. So urban consumption is driven by imported inflation. Imported inflation is driven by uh, inflated salaries that or inflation which is sitting in the U.S. and in Europe as 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 incomes go up or as salaries go up. So we, we are a direct beneficiary of uh, wage inflation in the West, which is coming to uh, which is coming to Indian services companies, and that's that's driving a lot of urban consumption uh, or driving a significant amount of urban consumption, which is uh, which is essentially so south of India. Um, uh, it the next slide talks about the strategies a little more in in. Uh, in terms of where we are positioned, uh, it's manufacturing and external businesses. Then that's almost that uh, uh, that uh, like the pie chart said it was almost at thirty percent. Energy related businesses, a lot of manufacturing in India is very energy intensive, and for, after a long time, India's energy consumption to GDP is moved to one point one is to one. Uh, we tend to believe that that would be a significant, I mean, utilities and the entire grid would be a significant beneficiary of uh, demand of electricity. And as also per capita income moves up, urban consumption is largely real estate. And we do have one QSR on our portfolio. Uh, this is the big, big part of the entire uh, uh, consumption metric is, continues to be, remain centered around urban areas in India. Rural India is having a little bit of distress given the fact that there is high, high agri-inflation in the entire system or food inflation in the entire system. Digitization, I think we're carrying on with our theme, which is which we've been running with our uh, historical portfolios for the last six years. Uh, largely B2B businesses uh, and 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 um, and distribution formats that are present out there. Uh, I'll just run you through a little bit of our thought process and in picking um, industries and and industries and companies at the bottom end of the cycle. And what are the drivers for all of this? So in in the next slide, which talks about pharmaceuticals, pharmaceuticals will be close to about fifteen percent of our, uh, our portfolio right now. Um, what drives? The bottom two uh, holdings in our portfolio, which is Aurobindo and Sinjin, uh, is the bankruptcy setting with uh, the US generic market. Okay, so what's happened in the US is that because of 2015, the patent peak that happened, a lot of companies went through a huge MA uh, process and picked up a significant amount of debt. Now, if you look at the balance sheet of these companies, uh, the two largest ones are Viatris and Teva. Both of them are sitting with clo debt close to about $22, uh, 22 billion dollars. Okay, uh, and at twenty-two billion dollars, uh, if I step back into two thousand and twenty, the cost of debt was about three percent. We know for sure that Teva has refinanced about three percent of its debt at about eight percent. Uh, in the last quarter. The 3% of the debt that came up for maturity, they funded it at about 8%. Now, that's where the table of, uh, of cost of borrowing is, is, is sitting with these companies. So, in, in short, uh, a significant amount of US companies have stopped investing in the generics business, which keeps the field wide open for the Indian companies. And 
the indian companies are net cash on balance sheet so if you look at aurobindo balance sheet net debt in that column aurobindo sitting with 325 million dollars of net cash and so is sinjin which is a cro and a crams manufacturer and a, which is essentially support for r&d services for the western companies that are there so that grow our thought process on pharmaceuticals uh, this has been sitting with a lot of our portfolio for 24 months and it's a reasonably sizable part of our portfolio even 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 in the india 2030 uh, 30 portfolios which are there the second one is the it services and the impact on consumption why i have i talked about this in 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 um, in, a, in a small format uh, but quite simply put together these are projections given by uh, the the association itself indian it services will double by 2030 2026 Uh, if we double in 2026 from 150 billion dollars to about 300 billion dollars, uh, if you just look at the second last line, which is total employee cost, right? Total employee cost will also move in the same format, which will go be up almost 40 percent. So we are looking at wage inflation coming from the west to India, the opportunity for IT services growing, and the opportunity for IT services growing. one single line item which is employee cost will drive cons- consumption going into uh, going into the next next couple of years and which is why the real estate real estate market in india is uh, is is holding up uh, this dramatically well just to give you a sense of uh, the last last two quarters of uh, last two quarters of given the last one year uh, of real estate data it, every old fresh inventory into the system is coming together only in 2027 and 2028 before that there is no deliveries which are no significant deliveries which are on the annual in any of the large metros in in the country in the country which effectively drives our uh, bias towards uh, a lot of a lot of these businesses that are there so uh, i i'd leave it with this uh, i'd hand this back to uh, mugundar and then we could probably then we could put it up for q and a's okay mugundar thanks kenneth uh, appreciate that and appreciate uh, the presentation and as i said i uh, will shortly turn it over to q and a i just thought we'd highlight uh, oldbridge uh, as we highlighted earlier um was founded in 2015 uh they ran a fund which started in 2016 till today um the annualized performance of that uh is about 17.7% uh the benchmark is about 12 um and you know pretty much over the period i think there was uh, only one period in 2018 2019 where uh, there was extreme concentration of only the top 10 stocks in india delivering anything positive apart from that uh, they've had a fairly consistent process um by which they have generated alpha um and that is in the existing life in uh Kenneth's prior life uh, at uh, standard Char- or kotak standard chartered and then idfc um the returns generated across the products that Kenneth managed uh, which was premier equity and sterling equity annualized anywhere between 20 and 25% uh over a um 10 year period um which uh, when you compare it to a broad index like the BSC 500 or a mid cap or a uh, large cap or small cap index uh, has shown uh, substantial outperformance over that period uh in just uh, a few quick details on the 2030 fund as uh we said earlier 15 to 20 stock uh, absolute maximum uh themes which will be 4 to 5 which uh, Kenneth uh, discussed the benchmark is the BSC 500 so whilst it's 30% of india's gdp it's about 93% of india's market cap uh so that's pretty broadly representative of the market um the objective would be to outperform over rolling 5 year periods it is a monthly unit price and monthly liquidity uh, has an information memorandum with the trustee uh, being equity trustees custodian being apex and bnp paribas um there's some, some fund constraints but uh, really it the aim is to provide a um you know focused exposure on the success, success story of india over the course of the decade uh with uh, relative flexibility in terms of 
uh, stock weightings up to 15%, although the portfolio currently has a top weighting of about 8% and a maximum cash weighting of 30%, really to provide liquidity at certain points uh, when uh, perhaps the cycle is a bit more challenged or when trying to identify the next theme or next stock to buy into at the right price point. With that, uh, I have to show you a disclaimer page because that's very important in uh, today's environment. So this is our uh, one page disclaimer, uh, happy to discuss with any one of you. Um, and I think I will now turn it over to questions. Uh, so please feel free to unmute yourself and introduce yourself quickly uh, and then ask a question of Kenneth. Uh, hi, Kenneth. Uh, my name is Brent Lister. I run a family office uh, here based in Sydney. Uh, thank you for uh, your, your presentation today. Uh, I just had a quick one in, and I was a couple of minutes late, so I apologise if it was covered at the start. But is there any of your thematics that you would consider as significantly contrarian or um, in, you know, against the grain in terms of what you know more... Um, I guess general fund managers are doing in India, or um, it's just that you're picking, you know, less thematics as opposed to contrarian ones. Okay, uh, so 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 what we do is also what we don't do, right? And why I say this is the one of our largest contrarian bets is uh, is is no financials or no banks. Uh, we have uh, within the benchmark uh, it. When we first started investing with India Avenues, the benchmark was about 40% in uh, banking and financial services. Today, it is down to 32% and uh, it's on its way lower. Uh, and that's where we stepped out of that entire business, entire, uh, in, in, entire segment of the market and focused on the manufacturing outsourcing uh, bit, of, uh, bit of the entire piece. We are the first investors in um, in uh, in pharmaceuticals. We continue to be the largest investor in pharmaceuticals. Uh, the second one was real estate that we did. We are the largest investor in real estate, and amongst all our peers, our percentage holding in real estate is significantly over every every single fund house that you would come across. Uh, what we what we also have at this point in time is a small holding in technology, which is through a company called HCL. Tech, uh, info system, ATL technologies. Uh, now, this is a business which has uh, uh, which has not done anything for the last two and a half years. And from a foreign investor perspective, uh, it is hitting its all time low in terms of foreign holding. And that is something of enormous amount of interest to us at this point in time. And, and Kenneth, so, when you say real estate, is it? Um like the equivalent of a, a, a real estate investment trust is it, what what type of real estate um, yeah. specifically? Uh, we, we do developers. Uh, the REIT market in India is not, does not give us, in, again, does not give us a significant amount of yield compared to what the government securities would do. Um, it does give us incremental amount of growth, but not enough compared to where the developers are. So even with the developers and every single developer in India, which is listed, has a has has a book has a uh, part of its entire balance sheet sitting in rental assets, which over a period of time they actually uh, list listed separately as a REIT. Got it. Yeah. Thank you, Ken. I actually had one more, <laughs> if that was okay. <laughs> yeah, go uh, ahead. And then you, you touched on the, the technology piece. Um, mm -hmm. From a early early seed, um, sort of pre-IPO, sort of fresh IPO, um, how, how do you see that space playing through in India? Uh, and, and do you see the fund um, looking at, you know, sort of more early stage stuff or, um, you know, straddling the, the pre-IPO, IPO phase? Mm. Uh, that, that, that hasn't been our investment style unless we find something extremely attractive. Uh, look, our investment process uh, is all about finding established businesses going through a down cycle. 
So if there is a company uh, which is doesn't have enough of uh, enough of uh, enough of historical evidence of performance, we normally stay out of it. Our sweet spot is uh, is is the second time over. Okay, um, so when a business has been uh, or when an industry has done extremely well, uh, gone through uh, gone through a fragmentation and then goes through a second round of consolidation, uh, that is more attractive to us because valuations are in our favor. The industry is out there in terms of which companies have survived, which companies lead the entire uh, uh, consolidation phase and uh, and the revival of. Uh, of of market shares or the growth of the entire business, I think that's uh, that's where we would predominantly have exposure to, if at all in the IPO pre IPO stage. Uh, I would not say we we completely eliminate looking at that marketplace, uh, but that would be less than five percent of our exposure over longer term periods. Okay, thank you. Um. Any other questions? I'm a good I, um, I might ask one, if that's okay. Please. Uh, yeah. uh, thanks for the presentation, Jeanette. Um, I was just wondering if I could hear some of your thoughts on the energy transition within India and whether any, uh, any companies are prominent on your radar. Or what's the best way to play this theme as well uh, going forward, do you think? Hmm. So uh, we've got a bunch of developers which are trying to do, uh, uh, which are trying uh, trying to do renewable energies, uh, both solar and wind. Uh, but currently, India's transition is about fifteen percent in renewables. The rest is still largely uh, a mix of hydro, nuclear, and uh, thermal. Okay. Uh, this over the course of the next uh, couple of uh, couple of years, or uh, uh, probably a decade. Uh, these mix of renewable will shift upwards, not because of any other reason, but it is far more economical uh, from a price point perspective than putting up a new thermal power plant or a nuclear power plant. Okay. So that shift will happen. Now, the best way to play it across uh, in India is the automation of the grid. Right, And we've got very few companies which are there uh, catering to that part of the market. So there's a grid expansion and there's the automation of the grid. Okay. And what we have in our entire portfolio is a small exchange or it's a monopolistic exchange, which is uh, the India Energy Exchange. Uh, now, it's a, also an industry which is heavily regulated and it's not specific to India, it's across the world. And we're getting used to uh, uh, new problems coming up with the regulator and how they would want to regulate this entire business, both from a pricing perspective, as well as from a licensing perspective. So once we have clarity on that, I think for us as an investor, we like the grid business a lot more than we like developers. And the best way to play it is go down that path. So there are a number of names out there. Uh, we've got one. We used to have another one, but I couldn't explain the valuations because the valuations of Hitachi Energy, Hitachi Power Products, uh, and that stock went to about 70 times earnings. So we took money off that, that one business. Uh, uh, okay, but, uh, but we still have it on our radar. So if, when, and how we had an opportunity to do it, uh, that company is one of the two businesses that provide smart grids in India. Oh, thanks very much for that, Ken. Anyone else, uh, any questions? Sorry. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Kenneth. Uh, I was wondering, yeah, you mentioned a few of the buy conditions um, that you look at. I was wondering what, what are the sell conditions? So like, is it purely valuation or is it a combination of valuation and fundamentals mm -hmm. that determine the peak of the cycle? So, so one data point that we don't like, okay, is when every, every company in the business or every company in the industry makes money. 
okay uh, and uh, the second one uh, and and when every company in the uh, business or in that particular industry makes money uh, usually the financial ratios are off the charts uh, so if I step back and I look at an industry called paints, which is Asian paints, uh, decorative paints, uh, okay, it's a building material business, uh, but the, the largest company in that industry made an ROE of 50%. And uh, in 2015 or 2016, when we started off with Overbridge, there were about four companies in that industry. Today, we've got about 10 companies in that entire business. Okay. Now, what happens um, in a, in a in an environment like that when you have a, a fragmentation of capacity? Uh, the fragmentation of the capacity is led by new capital coming in, which has got a lower hurdle rate. So, if Asian Paints makes a fifty percent ROI, okay, the new company coming in usually comes in with a ROI of fifteen percent, which is a cost of funds. And by the time the industry goes back into its next consolidation phase, by the time the industry goes into the next consolidation phase, you have an industry template where the return on equity comes down significantly lower. And I think that's where we would relook the business all over again. So our cell discipline is based on a, couple, a lot of factors, uh, basically two factors. Uh, one is a valuation risk. Second is enormous amount, I mean, fragmentation of an industry, which essentially means new capacities coming into the same business. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks, everyone, for listening in. Uh, if there are any last minute questions, we can take them. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you for listening in. Uh, we're looking to do this. Um, on a reasonable uh, basis uh, in terms of frequency going forward, um, as uh, I suppose uh, the interest in the India 2030 fund increases. So uh, thank you for participating, appreciate it, and look forward to catching up with all of you next time. Thanks, Magunthan. Thanks, Kenneth. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, I'm just gonna. Oh, I think. Yeah.